So I think wealth is an attitude. If you feel like you're so happy and so content with what you have, you are already wealthy. But if you have, uh, uh, you have, if you have to struggle every day, and you cannot feed, find happiness、um, either in your business or in personal life, I think you're not wealthy, even if you have billions in your bank account. Hey everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. Today's guest is best-selling author Ken Honda, an international phenomenon trained by the Warren Buffett of Japan. He's written more than 50 books on personal finance and sold more than seven million copies worldwide. His work bridges the gap between money management and self-development, and he's the first person from Japan to be inducted into the Transformational Leadership Council. By putting his own theories into practice, he was able to retire at just 29. And now spends his time writing, speaking, and publishing on what he's learned about money and human nature, and helping people develop a healthy and sustainable relationship with their finances, regardless of the economy. Ken, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Tom. I feel so honored to be here. It's early in the morning, and you're in the evening, and this is more fun doing this. Dude. I love that man, and、um, yeah. So you're obviously in Japan right now. For anybody、uh, wondering, so time zones for us are very, very different.、Um, but really excited. And one thing I wanted to talk about is that, like, how much of what you're doing do you think is uniquely Japanese?、Um, I, I have. Been to a lot of places in the world, and there are few places where I felt the cultural difference more palpably than in Tokyo. And I'm just curious how much that has influenced the way that you think about money. You know, as you said, my mentors have been、uh, teaching me so many things about money, but from a very different perspectives, mostly from Zen approach. So it's not uh, uh, Western people tend to think that I need more money to be happy. But instead, Zen approach is how can you find satisfaction in what you have. So it's not a matter of how much money you make or how much money you have. It's more about your attitude toward money and the relationship you have with money、uh, gives you happiness or miserable life. So you really have to be careful with what you have. What are some of the tenets of Zen? So I studied Zen. I, I got really hardcore into Taoism when I was younger,、mm-hmm. like way hardcore,、mm-hmm. uh, which led me then to studying Buddhism. I, I would definitely never claim to say that I practiced it, but studied Buddhism、um, a fair amount. Zen I found maybe the most intriguing but confusing. What、yes. are some of the like core tenets of Zen? So、um, I had this opportunity to meet my mentor、um, later on. Uh, his name is Wahei Takeda. So when I asked him to teach about money, he said his first lesson is forget about money. <laughs> so I was so confused. Yeah, one of the things that I found super、um, confusing, and people, so the, where I was going is the notion of a Zen Cohen, and this is something that people probably in the U.S. anyway be tangentially familiar with.、Mm-hmm. The most famous one we talk about is what is the sound of one hand clapping.、Mm-hmm. Um, And there are many Zen koans which are like beyond confusing. And of course, the idea is once you understand sort of the absurdity of the question itself,、uh, and of course, I'm, I'm doing this from a logical perspective, and Zen、mm-hmm. is, I think, meant to be very different than that. But、um, just to give people an anchor point, once you understand the absurdity of the question, then it's like you're a step closer to enlightenment.、Um, so when he said forget about money, what was he? What was he trying to get you to? Like, what does that mean? Because obviously it's not truly forget that it exists. Yes. So, what does he mean? So, I think、uh, he meant about、uh, where I focus. Because if you want money, you have to forget about money. You have to forget about what you can give to other people, how much service you can give out to the world, and then you receive money. So, he was telling me not to focus on money because money is the end result of what we get. After serving the world. So instead of focusing on what you get, you have to really focus on what you give. And, and, and the, our life is in the middle of giving and receiving. So unless we receive well, unless we, we give well, we can receive. So we are in this cycle of appreciation or, or resentment.、Um, either cycle you're in,、um, your life exists. So,、uh, if you start appreciating your life about everything, including money, your life will be filled with money and appreciation. If your life will be filled with resentment, anger, and fear, 
around money and also around life, your life will be also surrounded by life, uh, fear and resentment and anxiety. So he taught me how to focus instead of uh, just getting the end result of money. And he was very well respected because he was talking about philanthropy. So I'm teaching uh, about happiness and money ever since. Yeah, that the idea that he's been so incredibly successful obviously lends a lot of credence um, to the things that he says. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, I wanted to understand better about his teachings to you and your teachings, you've written so prolifically. Mm -hmm. What What is it like? How does it get that big? How does the topic sort of expand so far? What is it that people are getting wrong? And what are some of the like universal principles that are going to lead people to, um, I'll say wealth, and it's probably worth defining. How would you define wealth? And then we'll go back to those two questions. In my mind, wealth is uh, an emotion. You know, it doesn't really matter how much you have, how much you make. Because I've interviewed over the course of my career, I've interviewed many millionaires and billionaires, and some of them are very unhappy and very upset with everything. I'm sure you've met some happy ones and very unhappy ones. So, uh, and also among the people uh, who are struggling with life, there are also happy people and unhappy people. So I think wealth is an attitude. If you feel like you're so happy and so content with what you have, you are already wealthy. But if you, have, uh, uh, you have, if you have to struggle every day and you cannot feed, find happiness um, either in your business or in personal life, I think you're not wealthy, even if you have billions in your bank account. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to have money. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like about your approach is there, there is a recognition. So part of the reason that I think that people continue to strive for money um, I lived the nightmare of money can't buy you happiness. I had heard a thousand people tell me that money wasn't going to buy me happiness, that, you know, pursuing money outright was going to end up being a problem. And I still had to do it. And when I ran into the wall of, oh, really, truly money cannot buy you happiness. How is it that I ended up here when all the people told me that this was going to be the outcome? Why did I have to walk this path? Like, why couldn't I just accept their wisdom. And I realized that one of the things that people don't talk about is that money really is powerful. Money is, you call it energy. Um, I'll call it power. Like money gives you the ability to close your eyes, imagine something that you want to create and then open your eyes and actually be able to do it. And if you have the skill set, of course. Yeah. And so there, there's real utility in money. And when people talk about, in, and I've heard you say before, I don't want to get too spiritual. Like I want to keep this grounded. And I mm -hmm. think that that's really important because if you tell people, hey, forget about money, because money doesn't matter, there's going to be a turnoff. But if you yes. tell people, hey, forget about money because it's going to reorient your mindset, it's going to change your behaviors, it's going to align your behaviors to something that's actually going to allow you to generate actual money, mm -hmm. then I think that it draws people in a little bit more. So with that context, I want to go back to the two questions. So what are the mistakes that people make and what are some universal things people need to understand if they actually want to be wealthy in the way that you just defined? Mm -hmm. So I think most of us, the, uh, the biggest problem, I think, especially today, is that we are so afraid of money. And, and so as much as we want money, we are so scared of it. So uh, why do you say that? I think that that hit me is very counterintuitive. Why? Why do you think people are scared of money? It's because of a money trauma. I call it money wounds that we we've had since our childhood. Uh, we used to have some uh, unless your parents are perfect, <laughs> and we, unfortunately, it's not the case in in, in any any culture. So we've been scolded about money. You know, we spend too much, we wasted the money, or we denied uh, karate lesson or soccer lesson or uh, ballet lesson or piano lessons because it's expensive. Some of my friends were taught, "You are not worth it." <laughs> well, that's like that's a big blow. So. Uh, we've been denied so many times around money. So that's why as much as we want money, because we, we feel uh, money can buy happiness or money, money can buy at least freedom. But at the same time, money uh, have been abused, abused us for so many ways. So as much as we want to get close to it, but if we get too close to it, we get burns or like hurt. So uh, for a lot of people, money is a mystery person. 
So how do they begin to change that relationship? I'm assuming some of this is going to be just narrative around mm -hmm. how they talk to themselves about money. What do you advise people? You on have that? to start watching your, your language. Uh, my mother used to say that. <laughs> and then uh, around money, especially uh, a lot of people say like, you know, I was ripped off. So there are so many negative uh, language around money. And um, my mentor Wahe said, you have to use positive words around money. Otherwise, money will not like you. And I really, I thought it's very cute, you know. And then uh, in my book, I talk about what if, uh, if, if money were a person, who would it be like? Is that a person a gentle person or angry person? So just, um, you know, uh, you have to pay attention to how you relate to money. Uh, if you just um, feel like money is just a thing, like you don't care, but if you don't care, you know, uh, you end up uh, being in debt. So you have to be very careful and respectful for, for money. Uh, for some Japanese people, actually one of my students, made futon, you know, bed for a wallet. It's, it's so cute <laughs> to, to, to show respect. You know, while I rest, please, uh, money and credit cards, please rest here too. So it's like a, a little bed, like, like a cat, cat bed. <laughs> and then you're supposed to put uh, your wallet into the bed. So it's just a metaphor, but unless you show respect to money and uh, the money coming in, money going out both ways, you cannot really feel you cannot feel peaceful around money, especially uh, uh, this hard time of uh, economy. You have to really um, pay close attention to your emotions. And most of us are so controlled by uh, anxiety and fear around money. That's why I do things which are not really true to us to in order to survive. So we feel like uh, if we have no money, we cannot survive. That means your death. So uh, the funny switch is turned on. Uh, it's, I think it's our survival mechanism. Um, you know, 200 years ago or 300 years ago, everybody was a farmer. Nobody's, had, you know, probably don't uh, use much money. But uh, now, unless you have money, you, you cannot buy food. So um, money and survival are so tied in your system. Mm. So as people begin to tell themselves a new narrative, they build the futon bed for mm -hmm. their wallet. Um, they think about who that person is. And they I'm guessing a lot of people are going to think of that person as abusive or, um, you know, they wander off and they don't have a good relationship with that. So how do they begin to change their mindset around that? How do they begin to, to um, turn that narrative? Do you do you tell them to imagine somebody who is kind or gentle? Um, what is that process? So uh, the since we we've been abused, we feel like we've been abused by this person. We we are a little scared of this person, right? So I think the first step is actually the step that uh, my mentor Wahe Takeda uh, taught me. That is arigato your money, thank your money. When money comes in, either by uh, in a form of government check or a salary or commission or whatever um, the money you, you receive, you say thank you, arigato, thank you money for coming in. Because in these days, it's so so rare to find you and then and, and pay you. Somebody pays you, right? It either could be government or your husband, wife, or your, your clients. Uh, there are so many other people who do the similar job that you do, but they chose you to pay you. So like there are millions of reasons to appreciate for the money. So when money comes in, just say, Thank you, or arigato, or danke, or shesha, or whatever your language, or mercy, you know. And and then when you spend money, also arigato, you know, because you're getting something for the money. And uh, Wahe said, arigato in, arigato out. So it's almost like a karate kid teaching, you know, walks in, walks out. So he said, uh, arigato in, arigato out, if you do it for uh, two months, and then come back. So like, oh, I wanted to have some stock tips or like investment tips or I expected something different. But the, the thing I got is arigato in, arigato out. And I practiced for two months and I felt genuinely happier. So I recommend anybody, uh, you know, uh, just ha try it at least because it doesn't cost you anything. And once you start appreciating money coming in, money going out, you start appreciating about other things. So this uh, my arigato in, arigato out opens a door 
to a new life, which is full of appreciation. And I think we definitely need that. Uh, Wahe said, appreciation melts fear and anxiety. So if you start and if you keep appreciating money coming and going out, you cannot worry about money at the same time because a human mind can focus one thing at a time. So Wahe has a, a very interesting, unique trick uh, of um, um, sort of like changing our um, wire in our brain. So once you start appreciating, it's so funny because one of my students said, oh, gee, Ken, I forgot to worry about money for a week <laughs> because <laughs> you fo focus on uh, appreciation. Yeah, I think this is really powerful, is is a very important first step. And when I think about my own journey, um, I won't say that I had a negative view about money. And if you had asked me to describe what money was, I probably would have, whoever I could think of that was like glamorous and exciting and powerful, like that was my vision of money, which is why I was chasing it so hard. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, coming to understand, okay, I'm making more money than I've ever made, but I'm not happier than I've ever been. And the neurochemistry that I want to feel like this is not taking me there. And so I began to, what, what I began to do was change my behavior. So I changed my story about money that what I flipped over into was the only thing that matters is feeling alive. So I'm going to stop chasing money. I'm going to start thinking about value. And so I had a very negative connotation around money. And I just said, look, I'm going to set that aside for now. And I'm just going to pursue um, fulfillment. I'm going to do things to add value to people's lives. I'm going to work to improve myself. That was a huge part for me was always wanting to get better myself. Mm -hmm. And what I found was I needed both. I needed a change of mindset. I needed to stop thinking money was going to solve my problems. But I also needed to change my behaviors. And ultimately, I don't, I, no one is ever going to think their way to success. I think that you're, you, you have to think in a new way that is advantageous, but you have to act in a new way that's advantageous. So after, you know, when you do the wax on wax off, like eventually we do find ourselves in a karate tournament and we really do have to fight. Yes. So what does that look like, especially now in this crazy economy that we're going through right now? Let's get, let's go to that next phase. Mm -hmm. So people are, they're already arigato money in, arigato money out. They've got the futon for their wallet. Like <laughs> they're in a Zen place, like they're doing good. Now, like you retired at 29, not just because you were thinking, you retired at 29 because you ran businesses. You got very thoughtful about how to generate money and save it. Um, how should people be acting with their money? So we get now how they should be thinking, but how should they be acting with their money? Thank you, Tom. I think it's a beautiful question. And I, I, I think that's exactly what we need to learn. Um, because uh, once you start appreciating, your life shifts too. Uh, for example, one of the uh, readers on my book uh, she was a, a single mom uh, with a low paying job. She was working as a secretary. And then she came to me and she used to complain about uh, her low paying job. But after reading uh, my book, she uh, changed her attitude and she started appreciating about life and boss. And, and, and she realized that she didn't have a college degree, but she, got, she was hired as a secretary. So that's a big reason to appreciate her boss. Uh, before she was always complaining about him and I think the feeling really probably came across to uh, his, uh, her boss and she got a big raise uh, in a few weeks so once you start appreciating I, I've heard so many stories I can even write a few books on this uh, once you start appreciating your boss your clients uh, they appreciate you back so uh, uh, in my 20s the reason why I, I, I was successful was I was a little uh, unique in, in so many diff different things. For example, when I was doing accounting consulting, I divided my group, uh, clients to two groups. One, I do regular job. The other, I always uh, bring something whenever I, I got to meet them, just a herb tea, Japanese tea, like a book, or just not super expensive. So in six months, I got so many referrals from the, uh, the, the gift giving groups. You know, I didn't ask for any clients, right? But they gave me uh, so many referrals. And the second you know, uh, group, uh, not so much. So uh, I rec uh, recommend everybody to start giving more, uh, something a little extra, not like 30% more, but something to, to show your appreciation. And uh, it, it doesn't really matter if you're florist or cleaners or uh, uh, business lawyers or a dentist. If you start giving something, 
you get more. So uh, this is the law, I think. Uh, if you give more, um, you receive more. And then uh, there is one more extra reason to appreciate about. So you, you, your life would shift. So your whole energy would be so different and fo- so content. And I think people want to do business with happier people. You know, people don't want to go with people who are very depressed. So the people with the radiance of appreciation often attracts uh, more people and more opportunities. So this is not a new age or a spiritual thing. It's a practice to, to, um, to appreciate more. So uh, what you appreciate, appreciates. And I think it's, it's so simple. So start appreciating about money is a first step. And then start, second step is start appreciating what you have. And if you start sharing what you have, I call it gift. Uh, all of us have gifts. I've written probably like uh, half of my books, 20 books on how to discover your gifts and monetize them. Because uh, we are born, each of us is born with a special gift and uh, something to be shared with this uh, planet. And if you can find it and if you can uh, improve it and you can, you can polish it and just um, share with a, a society, I think um, that translates into money. So I wrote a national bestseller, uh, do what you love and make sure money follows you. So it's very important. You have to have both. So talk to me about that. So the hearing you, I've heard you say that before, that you've written that many books yes. on um, finding your gifts. So one, I'd like to know what that process is. I'm not a big believer, and I get this is, um, it'll be interesting to see your take on this. I'm not a big believer that we're born with something. Mm-hmm. Um but I think that we can polish, like you're saying, and, and really turn that into something. Um, how do people find it? Mm-hmm. And then how do they polish it? You know, I taught uh, probably personally over hundreds of thousands of people, you know, through seminars and my coaching. Uh, I do a big events, a few thousand people at a time. And uh, I do a lot of Q&As. So I have this track record of how people found their gifts. And uh, some people find find them when they're very young. You know, when, when you're five or six or seven, you uh, your neighbor finds out that you're very good at chess, and then he ends up being being champion. I've interviewed uh, a Japanese champion once, and uh, some geniuses are found that way. But most of us are not that way, right? We're not Olympic athletes, or we're not superstars. So um, most of us are not born with only one gift. We are born with several mediocre gifts. Like, uh, like I was, uh, I think I, I, had, I had a gift of speaking. I had a gift of uh, teaching. I had the gift of making jokes. I make, I make old jokes all the time. And, and money could be very boring. So, and money uh, is. There are so many funny stories, especially couples. But and anyway, so you know, so there are many gifts, small gifts, but you have to multiply them, and then you become one and only. So, so I know where you're going with that. Before we get to how you chain them together, how do you find them? Because that, what you just said really resonates with me. You've got minor gifts, mm-hmm. mediocre gifts, I yes. think was your exact phrase. I love that. Okay, so you've got these mediocre things inside of you. <laughs> how, do you how do you find them? Like, I don't, I don't know that people, and I know what your, the three things that you chain together are, mm-hmm. and that'll be really interesting to hear you talk about that, especially the third one, which you haven't mentioned yet. Um, how do people identify that? And maybe you walking us through how you found your three mm-hmm. will be super useful. Mm-hmm. So, you know, some people find it by coincidence. You know, some people find out that your your friend would say, hey, Ken, you're good at speaking. Like, uh, uh, what? You know, because gifts are a funny thing. It, it comes so naturally out of you. So you don't e- even notice it. So even if you're good at singing, you're good at uh, speaking, you're good at connecting people, that's another gift. Yeah, I think you have the special gift of connecting people too. Um, so if you have, even if you have so many gifts, you don't realize them unless you, you recognize them. And, uh, oftentimes, uh, I do, um, guide, uh, people to find their gifts and in the process, they realize like, oh, gee, all these years I've, kn- I've known that I had the gift, but I never recognize it as a gift because oh, how do you guide people through that? Do you have them ask themselves questions yes, or have, survey like, their friends some questions that people can go through? Literally a thousand? Yes. So, for example, one of the questions is like, uh, when uh, when you were small, uh, what what were the nicknames? And then the nicknames have strong something. Uh, by the way, uh, my nickname was a teacher because I was like <laughs> teaching kids. 
other kids. So like uh, you know, nicknames have certain uh, characteristics already. Or like uh, when you were kids, uh, what were you scolded uh, for? Uh, when I was small, uh, my mother used to say, you know, you talk too much, don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> that means I had the gift of talking because I want to express myself. So when you're scolded about something, that is a gift. But you thought it's a, a negative. It's it's your uh, actually it's your flaws instead of thinking it's a gift. So there are thousands of questions. And then when you just sh uh, show light on that, you realize, wow, I just never thought that I had so many gifts. And then once you kind of like recognize one by one, by one, and then start sharing um, without thinking much. You know, you don't have to be, at this point, you don't have to be strategic about uh, what what's going to happen because it's, well, you know, f fun things will come out. You never know. I've seen so many fun uh, uh, miracles happening to people's lives. So you discover certain gifts and then uh, once you realize the gifts will come out on its own. It's a it's so interesting organic mechanism that because you're so inspired by uh, sharing your gifts, because more you share, your people will love it, love it. And, uh, you know, your listeners will love your shows. They're waiting for your shows. They'll be upset if you just get a sick leave or something, right? So that like, people give you energy. So once this cycle starts and you appreciate them, for supporting you, it grows and grows and grows exponentially. And then when that happens, you don't want to stop. And then at some level, it will translate into money. So that's how let's talk about that. So there, there's um, a gap there that I think a lot of people fall into and don't know how to get out of. So yes. let's say that they they do the exercise. They you know think about what they were into when they were young. They mm -hmm. think about what they got scolded for, nicknames, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. Just things that they find interesting, and they go, okay, cool. These are the things that I think that I'm. It's a mediocre talent, but I'm willing to polish it and make it bigger. Mm -hmm. How do they monetize that? Like, how do they actually turn that into money? Yeah. So that is a miracle and also a fun part of life because you never know. Uh, one of my students was an insurance salesperson, and uh, he didn't sell uh, a lot because he didn't want to push people. I'm sure a lot of people are, can relate to that. And one day he was he was told to do cold calls, He so he had to go to the uh, one, one big house where there was a German shepherd. And then uh, he knew that he loves dogs. And you know, some people, dog lovers, dogs know you know, who they are. So when he was uh, in the house and, and he didn't, and, and it says beware of dog, but he, he didn't really care. So the dog, the dog didn't really um, uh, shout at him and bark at him. And uh, the owner, uh, grandmother, was so impressed because everybody was harassed by this dog, you know, mailman and a delivery man. And uh, so she thought it's, you know, it's interesting. So why don't you come up to my house and have, have a cup of tea? And then he was invited in, and and then she fell in love with this guy because you know uh, whoever uh, her dog loves uh, this person means he's a good man. <laughs> and then uh, she was a head uh, figure in this uh, entire neighborhood, so he could sell so many insurance policies. And later on, he found this dog club, uh, and then. Uh, so like a, uh, they do only barbecues, you know, they do nothing but with dogs, you know, by the riverside and they go on a trip. And so all he does is not selling insurance. But since he, he ha he's surrounded by so many people, you know, uh, there is a need for insurance. He gets it. There's another insurance uh, per salesperson who she loved cooking. So she kind of like did the cooking classes right for free. And uh, and uh, cooking classes grew, and uh, she ended up being uh, uh, the cooking class teacher. But uh, she sold so many insurance policies uh, on the way, and uh, she found more passion in cooking. So he she quit the insurance uh, business. But in the process of expressing and finding who you are, happy money f uh, follows you. So uh, forget about money is that teaching. But you know at, at the same time. Don't forget it completely. You have to make both ends meet. So uh, that's, you know, I have this accounting uh, consulting background. So I'm a very practical person. So you have to make sure all the bills are paid in appreciation and at the same time grow um, your your energy. Um, uh, the most biggest problem that we have is 
that we are depressed with our lives. So we don't have hopes. We're not excited about li- our lives. That's why I think it's Dude, talk to me about that. So how do, how do people flip that around? You know, um, you have to take a look at um, life in a different perspective. That's why I'm teaching. Uh, for example, one of my uh, in my seminars, I take a lot of questions, and uh, it was you know, thousands of people. So in, in in the back, so I couldn't really see the the person who asked me a question, and she said, "I'm too old," and she sounded very young, <laughs> and and I couldn't really, I can't really see how old are you, and she said, "I'm 23." And everybody's like, ooh. <laughs> and then <clears throat> she said, I'm the oldest oldest person in college. Everybody's like 19, 20, and I'm I'm an an I'm an you know old grandmother. <laughs> it's like people are laughing. And uh, she felt uh, she felt so old and she's so out of date. Uh, and uh, then I realized that I don't know who how old you are, but you're 35, 45, 55, 25, or five. You are the oldest in your life, right? So I heard a seven-year-old boy saying, like, oh, I'm getting old, you know? <laughs> so if you're oldest at your age, and uh, from your future, you are the youngest, mm. looking back 10 years from now. So you are the oldest and youngest at the same time. So some people start old. So don't compare with other people. Some people start young and then successful in their 30s and 40s and they collapse in their 50s. So don't compare yourself with other people. Just look at yourself and focus yourself. And if you focus on who you are and what will come out of you, uh, your life, and uh, the best thing I, I, I can give you is I want you to be curious about your life. You know, what is inside me? that is going to be turned into money or turned into something that will please and, and entertain so many people. And it could be your writing, could be your cooking, could be something else. You know, for me, it was speaking and writing. I never knew I could write and I could speak until I was 33 or 4 when I started writing. So you, you, you'll be surprised by yourself. I was surprised at myself. Like, I didn't know I could write and speak. So it's interesting. There's there's a few things in here that I want to try to pull apart. So um, one is Peter Thiel talks about competition being for suckers. Mm -hmm. And he says you want to go somewhere where there's no competition. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about if you identify one gift, you might not be unique. Maybe there are a lot of people that share that gift. And then you said, but if you can find two or three gifts and you put them together, then you may be one of the only. And so you've said the gifts that you had that you've taken the time to polish are uh, you can write, mm-hmm. you can speak, and you consider yourself a healer. And you said, once I put them together, and and f- if I misspeak how you define healer, let me know. But you're saying, I help people heal their past traumas about money to change yes. the story, the way that they think about it. And, and I thought, well, that's actually really interesting. And it does make you an incredibly unique voice. And when I was first looking at you and, and researching you for the show, it was like that that puts him in this very unique category, unlike because I've since the economy has taken the hit that it's taken, I've been trying to find people that have a really useful voice in finance to help the average person through this. I don't want to bring in high level investors that are going to talk about gold and all that shit. It's like that does not help the average person get through what we're going through. So seeing you bring those three things together in this incredibly unique way, I think is interesting. So we've got that, Mm -hmm. the find your unique place. And then we've got this other concept you're talking about, which I think I think is insanely important. And I, I want to know if to you, these end up coming together, which is people are depressed about their lives and they're depressed about their lives because of how they look at it, the frame of reference, the story they're telling. So th- this is my mission, like getting people to reframe their life is like what I think about day and night. So how do people, you obviously gave us what I'll call the tip of the iceberg just now in terms of how they can begin to reframe and get out, but that unique gift of, of turning yourself into sort of a unique commodity. Um, do you see these things coming together in any way? Yes, I think you said it so beautifully. One of my favorite seminars I do, at least here, you know, I do, this is a retreat center I have, is uh, reading your life script. That means- uh, That you write yourself uh, read. or- uh, yes, or uh, I don't know who wrote it, but uh, definitely there is a life script. When you look at your life, 
there are so many a series of events that shifted your life and also uh, made who you are. And uh, most mostly, in uh, what I found is among all the negative events that you had, that your father was killed in in war, or your you, your your parents got divorced, or you got uh, sick when you were like eight or ten. So among all these negative events, there is a seed of your life purpose. So if you find your life purpose, you will be very different forever. Because once you know you are born to do, I mean, not like, a, you know, uh, almost like enlightenment, but it's like a slight enlightenment. Wow, I think I was born with these, you know, hard hardships because I think I maybe I meant to do this. You know, I was uh, in this abuse. I was brought up in this abusive environment. My father's wealthy, so he had money and fame, but we're miserable. So that's why that set me uh, to this journey to find happiness, the quest for happiness and money that turned me in that that turned me who I am. And that's so I feel, can you give us a little background? Your, the story with your dad, I think, is, is very, very interesting. You know, my father was a very successful accountant and consultant. So but he was a very samurai type of guy. He never cries. He never just smiles and just a very rigid guy. So I was in this environment where we knew we uh, we had money. But uh, we didn't have the uh, safety in our house. So I really wanted to know why people are messed up that way. And then why can't we, we cannot find peace and happiness in our, in our, um, in our family. So that was the, the real start of my, um, of my life. Talk to me about the time that you um, came home and found your dad crying. Yeah. That, that, that was super intense. Yes. Um, I think I was eight or nine years old when I came home and uh, I saw my father crying like a baby. He was really crying in in kitchen. I was super surprised. And my, my mother took me aside and just explained what, what, what's going on. But I was in total shock because I've never seen my father or man crying. And my mother told me uh, that uh, my father's... Um, friend, um, not, not best friend and, and his client, uh, committed suicide. And uh, I sort of knew what suicide mean, but uh, it's not he, only his uh, life. He killed uh, his entire family and after he killed himself. We call it family suicide. And that was the first time I learned about the term family suicide. It was very par uh, particular in Japanese culture. Uh, in, 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 in order to save uh, his family from the disgrace of bankruptcy, he had killed an entire family, uh, and also he killed himself. And he, uh, he came to my father a few days before to ask uh, uh, for a loan. And he had the money, but he didn't give it to him because um, the money he loans to his client, his friend, would go directly to loan sharks. So he was recommending to file bankruptcy, and after bankruptcy, he was going to give the money. The money can be used for the family. But he's a samurai guy, but he, so he didn't tell him that he has the money. But he said, no, I'm not going to loan, loan the money. So he regretted, regretted, regretted after the family suicide, and that really triggered him into going into alcohol. So uh, killing the entire family because of money really scared me, gave me a lot of nightmares for, for days. Sometimes I, I still sometimes get that when I hear you know, news that uh, somebody lost jobs and, and millions of people uh, losing jobs. So I'm, I'm feeling a little restless about what's going on. That's why I'm more uh, inspired to help other people to find peace and happiness. But uh, he really didn't recover from that. And he passed away 17 years ago. But um, so but uh, I think my father's generation and my grandfather's generation, I feel like uh, they're giving me powers and an inspiration to to for me to share what I know. What do you mean by that? You're saying in in that trauma, in the way that they got caught up in it, that yes. gives you the power to. Yes, because I I feel it's interesting, man. It's an interesting way to frame it. Yeah, I feel so much pain around uh, around him, and I feel so much uh, pain for my uh, grand grandfather. 
who died when he was 42 or 3 because of the war. So this uh, three generations of uh, unhappiness and despair and anger and resentment is all kind of like cleaned in me and also gets healed and transformed and become this uh, 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 incredible amount of energy to 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 be able to support people. That's why I think my books uh, have been sold millions of copies because I love to help people who are in anxiety, fear, and uh, resentment because in some some uh, area we are upset about not being fair, right? So, but on, unless we heal this pain that's inside, it's nothing to do with money. It's nothing to do with what's going on out there. It's nothing to do with uh, politics. It's inside. It's the wounds and the money scars and and all the generational block that uh, uh, have, have been handed down from our parents and negative beliefs around money and about life and work. Uh, they're also handed down from our grand grandparents, right? So it's being a generational block. So if you can uh, turn all the pain into life force energy, you, you know, you feel this insp inspiration in you that will keep you going. So otherwise, you have to shut them off. Otherwise, you have to shut them off. I was, what do you mean by that? Uh, because you don't want to do, um, you know, uh, I know a friend whose father is also alcoholic and he doesn't want to remember any of his childhood. He doesn't want to just see. talk with his, uh, you know, father. Either forget about it or you have to reframe it and yeah. make it useful. That's very, very interesting. Um, you've actually talked a lot about friends. Having a good friendship network is actually more valuable ultimately than having a lot of money. Um, I'm super that that is such an interesting reaction to your daughter. I did not expect that. <laughs> um, what are what are some other elements of building friends? And then um, I think it will help people. Why is friendship more protective, maybe the right word than money? You know, um, I always talk about um, how to melt money fear. I uh, told them I, I teach people. Uh, make friends because they are the asset. They are the insurance for you when the economy well, uh, econ economy breaks down. Uh, you know, everybody has a friend who can let you stay for a week or two. And uh, I kind of like counted, you know, just wrote down the names. Okay, he's good. You know, this guy is maybe two weeks, you know. And then uh, I, I calculated more than 50 friends. And then uh, I can stay uh, one friend at one week, second second week and then after 52 friends i can come back to my friend number one and say it's been a year how are you so so without any money i can uh live forever i have enough friends who can support me so i have no fear on money uh, because i know somebody will just um take care of me and the feeling uh i have no debt so i i'm not in the near of uh, uh, i have, i don't plan to file bankruptcy uh, but even if I lose everything, I have so many friends and supporters who can help me. So um, whatever happens to me, I feel somebody is going to just catch me, protect me. So if you have that feeling that somebody will not let you fall, uh, you feel safe. So it's not the government. It's not your insurance. It's not the money in the bank. Uh, you know, it's your friends and people who care about you. And uh, if you have a complete trust in, in the future, you don't have to worry about money. You know, uh, people worry about money because they worry about no money situation. And I have interviewed so many millionaires who happen to be in no money situation many times. And no money situation doesn't kill you. Uh, worry about no money situation kills you. So I think you'll have to explain to people the difference between no money and being actually afraid of the no money situation. Yes. What do you mean by that exactly? So say uh, you run out of money, cash, right? And then you have you cannot pay the rent. You have to get out of the, your apartment and you, you say file bankruptcy, for example. So have, being in no money situation is not comfortable. I've never been one uh, because I've been very careful, but I've known uh, people and friends who, who, who have been into a situation. They don't want to go back there again, but it didn't, uh, the experience didn't kill them. You know, it's kind of depressing, but at the same time, uh, once you lose everything, 
you realize that so many people are kind to you. Uh, one of my friends who filed bankruptcy on the night, he got a call from at least five friends who just say, uh, why don't you come to my house, you know, have an extra room. And then he, he just cried while he was on the phone. So people, uh, when, when he was successful, he didn't care about friend, his friends, right? He was so like you know, successful. But uh, people are so obsessed, almost like obsession, have this obsession of uh, making sure that there they will not be in no money situations. That's why they are not taking risks and start their own businesses. That's why they are not leaving their jobs. That's why they are not leaving their husbands and wives because they are so afraid that one day you'll be in this no money situation, which is like uh, they're more afraid of no money situation than death. So I'm just teaching people no money situation is not, uh, it could be a scary place, but that could be a great start for uh, uh, financial independence. So whenever I, I uh, get an email saying I filed bankruptcy two days ago, I was sent back an uh, email saying, congratulations, you are in the starting point toward financial independence because uh, they are. Yeah, I, I think that reaction is really, really powerful. And I've thought about so and you talk about this pretty openly, just because I am wealthy today does not mean that I'm going to be wealthy at 50. Yes. So especially now in an economy where something I could never have imagined is happening, you go, hmm, like nothing is forever. Yes. And one of the things and this is bring it all back around to Zen, where what I found so intriguing about Buddhism was the revelation that life is suffering. And once you realize this is a game, so now I'm using my words, I don't know that any Buddhist would ever say what I'm about to say, but this was my interpretation of Buddhism. Once you realize that you're playing a game of neurochemistry, and when you suffer because you want something, or you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, or you have a negative story that you're telling yourself about your own self-worth because what your parents said to you, you're not worth the money, or you know they're shaming you for how you spend your money, or whatever the case, like whatever has happened to you, whatever wound you have, like people begin to to get a sense of self that is about that wound, and so they're not feeling good, and they they're trying everything they can to escape that, and it's like okay, what is the sort of original progenerator? of this sense of suffering, desire, right? And so that Buddhist notion of desire gives birth to all of your suffering and understanding like the notion of attachment and that when you are obsessed with money, rule number one, forget about money. Like if you really wanna make progress, that notion is, is so critical for people to understand, to, to ask themselves, what is the physics of this situation. The physics of this situation is you're having a biological experience. Your brain is kicking off certain um, neurotransmitters and um, a cocktail of chemicals that makes you feel a certain way. Either that certain way feels good or that certain way feels bad. And really beginning to understand what's happening inside your mind is the very thing that manifests the good feeling or the bad feeling. Okay, well, great. If this isn't about external stimulus, if it's not about I have a lot of money and I feel good, I have little money and I feel bad, and it's what am I thinking and feeling inside myself and how much control do I have over that, like you really begin to understand. And I look, I think that the way you think is only one part of the equation. I don't think that um, Wahe became you know, the Warren Buffett of Japan simply because he thought in positive ways. Mm -hmm. But it, until you get that part right, your, your behaviors just won't align with anything useful. Um, that's what I found myself drawn to in your philosophy is that notion of taking this very Zen approach of having those realizations about the way that this is a mental game. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. You said it so beautifully. And uh, culture difference too. Uh, I've been interviewed by so many different people from different cultures. Uh, one of the most uh, often asked questions in America is like, uh, I, I talk about money container. You know, everybody's born with a certain size money container is what I, what, I, what I say. And American people want to know, how can I make my money container bigger so I can be wealthy? So that is a typical question I get from North America. So it's a totally different approach. So uh, it's a, you know, it's not a good or bad, uh, but if you just, just totally shift. So I teach uh, Japanese people 
more American way. Okay, well, you're okay. You know, don't be satisfied. Dream, dream big. For North American people, maybe you don't need a big house. May, maybe you don't need three cars. You know, you could downsize and still find a fulfillment in life too. So you have to really kind of like change perspectives. So that way, you can really uh, uh, find out who you are, and uh, without all the toys, you can be still happy. And uh, I think that's what everybody is experiencing. Like, what what do I? Let me ask you. That I was literally going to ask you that question. So, in researching you, I started thinking, what would I do if I lost all my money? Mm -hmm. How would I find like my or how the way that I think about it, how would I create my a happy life? Um, and I began to think about like what are the things that cost very little money but bring me an extraordinary amount of joy? What are those things for you? I think you know there are many B and B here, so. I want to be hired by somebody in this in, in, in the neighborhood, and then whoever comes in, just I'll do the chores, and uh, meanwhile I have a little chat with them, and then I, I I ask them a few questions, and then they get lit up and like, wow, gee, I want to go home and just start my something. So I just want to be a, a like a old guy just sweeping <laughs> floors and just have a friendly chat. No, you know, not as a famous person, just a just a regular guy, just exchanging ideas. And then after 30 minutes of uh, friendly conversation, he or she feels so much lighter, more fun, and more joyful. And that's how who I want to be. And I'm okay with a rice ball and uh, some fish or like some vegetables. I love that, man. That is fantastic. Where can people um, connect with you? So I have not much information yet in English. Uh, you can find uh, Google Ken, K-E-N, Honda, H-O-N-D, as in the car, and KenHonda.com. Or I've been interviewed by somebody like you um, who are so um, beautiful. Um, so there are some YouTube uh, videos that are up, um, up. And I am creating many uh, free content uh, so how people can find gifts and all that. So I'm trying to uh, translate um, many of, I have stacks of books and also uh, many work and a lot of fun stuff. So being translated into English. I love it, man. Well, Ken, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Um, really, really incredible. I think super powerful. And uh, I hope that people will dive in and, um, watch the videos, which I have done. They're fantastic. Read the book, Happy yeah. Money. Fantastic. Um, thank you, man. All right, guys. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Thank you so much. As we leave the perfection of childhood, the hypnosis and the brainwashing begins. Our well-intentioned parents say, oh, you want to be an astronaut? You want to start a business when you grow up? You want to paint like Jean-Michel Basquiat? Be reasonable.